Australian stories. Hey slash x slash, this is the first time I've come to this board and I have three Australian stories to share. I normally do not share my stories with anyone except close friends and family because, to be honest, they make me sound like an absolute crackpot. A friend of mine urged me to post here, as it allows me to remain anonymous and this community seems, perhaps too, open-minded. Before I start with the stories, I'll give a bit of background on myself. I'm a 29-year-old guy living on the Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia. For those that may know the area, I grew up just outside of Rath Downey on a 600-acre property which has been in my family since the area was first colonized by Europeans. I moved to the Gold Coast when I was 20 to allow my fiancé, now my wife, to further her career in finance. My skill set was mostly limited to aquaponics maintenance and fish care which I found was next to useless in the city so I turned my attention to my true passions, writing and fishing. I was soon picked up by one of Australia's largest fishing magazines which lead me on countless fishing trips around the country. It was on these trips that these stories occurred, and also the reason I've taken the screen name of Aussie Fish Journal for these posts. I drink alcohol and smoke cigarettes but I was not drunk during the events that happened in these stories, and I do not take any recreational or prescription drugs. The first story I'll share with you happened in 2009 in Northeastern NSW. I was doing an article on the recently rehabilitated Clarence River Cod, Maculakella Ikei, also known as the Eastern Freshwater Cod, in the area and basically had a week to travel an entire river system by kayak and tag as many cod as I could. This trip was purposefully correlated with a full moon on the last night, as it would provide the best conditions for targeting cod with surface lures throughout the night. For anyone who may be interested, the trip itself was, for all intents and purposes, a complete failure as I only managed to catch four cod, all neonatal and tagged from a previous restocking program. However, it was the occurrence on the last night of the trip that I will be sharing with you. I keep a tight journal on all of these trips as it allows me add personal, and anecdotal, insight when writing articles, as well as ensuring that I do not forget to include any important details or events. This is, word for word, but only including pertinent details, a copy of what I wrote in my journal that night. With a tally of eight base, two tundons, a spangled perch and a foul-hooked eel, today was another cod-less day. The entire camping area above the falls was taken by a cavalcade of caravans and I settled for a small patch of cleared shrubbery below the falls, but far enough away that I would not be in danger of flooding and so that the crashing water would not keep me awake. Three curlews entered camp shortly after I was set up and I offered them some cooked perch, but they would not take it even after I threw it well out of arm's reach odd to see them in this area. Moonrise tonight will occur around midnight and I will do my best to wake up throw surface lures at every eddy I can find. Conditions are still comfortable but cold, no clouds or rain. Water is flowing reasonably hard over the falls but the depth is significantly lower than it was four months ago. That was the final entry for the trip, as the next morning I was in no mind to write down the following events. Again. I will try to keep it as concise as possible without missing important details. I woke to my watch's alarm at 11.30 pm without worry and made the short walk to the base of the falls. Moonrise was still at least half an hour away but I decided to have a few exploratory casts, mostly just to try to warm up as the temperature was around the 4 degrees Celsius mark. On the 4th of 5th cast I managed to snag up on something near the other side of the creek. Instead of shining my light over the creek and ruining my chances of catching a fish over the next half an hour, I decided to wait for the moon to rise so I could see where was stuck and retrieve it the following morning. I sat down and had a cigarette and tried to stay warm. I considered going back to camp but I knew this was my last decent chance to tag a few cod so decided to sit there and shiver until the moon rose. What happened next is a classic cliché. As it was long after summer, the roar of the cicadas wasn't present, but insects, frogs and other nocturnal animals created a much quieter, but, in my opinion, much prettier, symphony that would fill the night air. 
Just as the first rays of light from the moonrise had come over the falls and illuminated the creek, I noticed that the faunal noises were non-existent. The only sound present was that of the running water and I sat there with a certain curious suspiciousness. It is a hard feeling to explain one where something just feels off but you can't figure out what it is. I was feeling pretty spooked and decided that it wasn't worth hanging around for a $15 lure, so I grabbed my rod and was ready to make my way back to camp. I took one last look at the falls, and that's when I saw it. There was a large, thin object at the top of the falls, illuminated by the moon. It was definitely not there during the day and my first thought is that it was a large tree or huge group of branches that had been washed down the river overnight. And then it stood up. This thing was between 6 and 8 meters tall, incredibly thin, and very human-like in shape with arms much longer than a human has. I am, by no means, an artist but I have attached a picture here of what it looked like in the moonlight. It slowly raised its arms into the air, as though it was reaching to the moon itself, and that's when I noticed two of the same creatures standing beside it. I'm not sure if they were there the whole time I didn't notice because I was fixated on the one in the center or if they appeared as it raised its arms. All three of these things had their arms raised into the air for a few seconds before completely vanishing. It took me a second to realize they had disappeared because their silhouette against the moonlight was that strong it had made an imprint on my sight, similar to when you look at the sun and see sunspots in your vision for a few seconds after. This next part was by far the most disconcerting event of the night. Anyone who has ever been out in a thunderstorm at night will know how surreal it is when a bolt of lightning illuminates the world around you for a split second. For that minute amount of time you can see everything in a bright white light, almost as though a giant spotlight has been cast upon you. Well a few seconds after the things vanished, the moon had just made its way completely over the top of the falls and suddenly it was like daytime. For 4 or 5 seconds I could see everything around me in a strange white light, similar to the lightning effect I just mentioned but lasting long enough that I could look around the entire area. Forgot the picture in my previous post so attached it here. The only real detail I managed to notice over this period of light was three curlews standing together on a small platform near the base of the falls about 20 m away from my position. I think the only reason my brain recognized that they were there was because they stood out so well against the water and rock face behind them. And just like that the light was gone, the bush once again only lit up by the moonlight. I stood there in shock of everything I had just seen for at least 5 seconds before a long, whistling sound jolted me back to reality the song of the curlews. For anyone who doesn't know how the curlews sound, Click this link https colon slash slash www.youtube.com slash watch question mark v equal sign n b a t zero d v five y n a. It's quite a spooky call at the best of times and, given the situation, was too much for me. I dropped my rod and raced back to camp, scrounged every piece of wood I could find in the immediate area and built the fire up as large as I could. Well, that's basically it for that story. Nothing else eventful happened, I retrieved my rod, but not my lure, the next morning, traveled downriver and got picked up by a 4x4 around 11am, as was previously planned. In hindsight, I wish I had spoken to the caravanners camped above the falls to see if they saw anything that night. I later did a little bit of research and found that large, Thin humanoids play a large part in aboriginal culture from all over the country often in the form of things like quinkins. That was my first experience with how weird the Australian bush can be and in all honestly, I stayed away from remote places for quite a while afterwards. However, in the next story that I'll tell I found that odd things can happen in quite populated areas. This next story happened on one of the many Moraton Bay Islands in southeast Queensland. I normally will be happy to divulge the locations of where my stories have occurred, but in this case I was asked by the locals, one person in particular, not to tell anyone which island it was. I will say that it is in the southern part of Moraton Bay and has an expanse of mud flats. The Moraton Bay region has quite a history, along with some well entrenched folklore everything from leper colonies to escaped convicts becoming cannibals and many wars between aboriginals and European settlers. 
it is a relatively highly populated area and borders Queensland's capital city of Brisbane. I was here to get some photos for an article about fishing with bait on inshore, shallow reefs and hoped that I'd be able to cast net a large amount of bait fish, such as pike, mullet, garfish and whiting, for bait rigging photos. This particular area was largely was largely unfamiliar to me, but I decided my best bet of catching bait would be to spotlight the mudflats and mangrove areas on the 10 p.m. high tide. I was being helped by an older bloke who had just started a charter boat business in Moraton Bay and I'd promised to give him some free advertising in the magazine if he could get me onto some good fish the following morning. We headed down to the flats around 9 p.m. and began wading through the murky waters, both with a cast net in our hand and a cigarette in our mouth. This is fairly customary in this part of the world as it is the only surefire way of guaranteeing the mosquitoes and midges stay well away from your face. We were both wearing strongly powered headlamps, around the 1000 lumen mark, which were only turned on a few seconds before throwing the net, otherwise you risk spooking the fish. The rest of the time we were in darkness, out 100m from the shore in knee deep water. Your mind tells you that every rock you step on is a stonefish and every piece of seagrass that touches your leg is a bull shark that's come in to check out its net feed, so it's a bit of an adrenaline rush. From memory, we were doing quite well within the first half an hour and had 20 or so garfish and a few pike both perfect snapper baits. We decided to head back to the shore to roll a few more cigarettes and put our captured fish into an esky in the back of my ute. We were almost back, about 30 m away, when my friend said there's someone at the ute. I looked up and could just make out a faint shadow of what looked to be somebody crouched down near the back of my ute. This wasn't totally odd, as there is a permanent population of 120 or so people on the island, but the fact that they were snooping around in the darkness made me very suspicious. My friend and I whispered about what to do and decided that we'd walk through the water as quietly as possible until we were 10 m away from the ute, then we'd hit it with our headlamps at full power and ask this person exactly they thought they were doing prowling around our car in the middle of the night. I carry a multi-tool on my belt at all times when I'm fishing, mostly to dispatch fish and cut line. In this case it was my Leatherman Surge, which has a reasonably sized knife in built, and although I had no intention or expectation about using it, having it with me did make me feel a little bit better about confronting our prowler. Well we got about 10 m away from my ute and I patted my friend on the shoulder to signal let's do it. Both headlamps came on, fully illuminating a 20 m area right around the vehicle. What was staring back at us was shocking this prowler was certainly not human. Standing on two legs about 130 centimeters high it seemed to be covered in either dense hair or a very heavy coating of mud. In an instant it turned to us, let out a yelp, very similar to a noise made by a dog in pain, and took off into the mangrove trees which bordered the east of the mud flats. Its movements were not a run or a walk it seemed to glide or hover straight towards the mangroves and disappeared into them as soon as it reached the tree lean. I only caught a split second look at its face but it did not seem ape-like, as is often the case in Yowie and Bigfoot stories, but more like a dog but with less of a snout. Quite hard to explain and definitely too hard for me to draw. Its eyes were hugely reflective it was almost like the light from our headlamps had hit two small mirrors and was directed back at us. We were both, understandably, quite shocked from the incident and threw our gear into the back of the ute and drove to the most well-lit part of the island, a small grassy park near the pub. We did not check for prints or anything in the area as, honestly, we just wanted to get the hell out of there. The next night we quietly and almost embarrassedly asked the bartender if there were any wild dogs or similar animals on the island hoping for a rather menial explanation for the prowler we had encountered. His facial expression formed what would be best explained as a wry smile, and replied with no dogs but there are mangrove men. He directed our attention to an old bloke in the back of the bar and told us to ask him about them. My fisherman friend was quite tired from a full day out in the boat and decided to call it a night, and I had another drink alone before getting the courage to talk to the old man in the corner. The conversation that ensued was one of the most interesting ones I've ever had, and I will condense it into a few points. 
The prowler we had witnessed the previous night was a mangrove man, called a Junjuri by local aboriginal groups. In the past they were present in the entire Moraton Bay region but destruction of mangroves has resulted in them now inhabiting only four islands. They, or something very similar, also live in the mountain regions on the mainland. I am not sure if he was talking about Yowies, as we know them in popular culture, 6 to 10 feet tall, or smaller creatures like the one I saw. They haven't been known to harm humans but are apparently quite mischievous and the one near my ute was probably looking for fish or food. The aboriginals do not consider them to be an animal or a spirit, but somewhere in between. They are well known to many of the locals in the area, many have seen them but many only believe them to be folklore. The old man I was speaking to had built up somewhat of a rapport with the Junjuris, often leaving them food or toys, with their favorite toy apparently being squash balls. It was all quite a shock to me. The fact that these things were living in areas close to the largest city in Queensland just seemed ridiculous, but I cannot just ignore what I saw. My friend's charter business is doing quite well these days and I try to have a fish with him at least three or four times a year but we have only spoken about that night once since it happened. He has never told another person about it for fear of sounding like he's insane, which is totally understandable. I have returned to island many times since but have not had another seen anything else out of the ordinary and on my last trip in early 2014 I was informed that the old man I spoke to had passed away. I honestly can't help but feel incredibly privileged to have seen something that doesn't exist and it really changed how I view a lot of things in life. This is the last story I have for you guys. A friend of mine runs an eel farm just north of Brisbane and whenever I get the chance I like to help him out. Now the farming of eels isn't a particularly difficult process when utilizing modern technology, but it is impossible to breed them in captivity. Their life cycle is actually quite amazing all the freshwater eel species in Australia actually migrate tens of thousands of kilometers to the coral sea to breed, and then their eggs and larvae float back to mainland Australia on the ocean's currents. What this means is that all farm eels are caught as wild stock, generally collected in their larval form in sophisticated eel traps. However, my friend also offers an eel removal service, where he'll remove mature eels from a water body for a fee. Normally he'll do this at golf courses or council-owned parks but occasionally he'll do it for privately owned farm dams who are looking to remove the eels in order to stock more edible species of fish which is where the story begins. We were setting eel traps on a property located in the Numbinba Valley, southeast Queensland this is largely considered to be the westernmost geographical limit of freshwater eels in the region as they rarely find a way to cross over the great dividing range that runs up the east Australian coastline. This generally means that individual eels are few and far between in this area, but if conditions are suitable you may get huge populations of very large eels in very small areas. These small areas are generally farm dams miniature lakes that are built to supply water for small-scale agriculture processes. Because of the high amount of nutrients in the runoff from the agriculture, there is often large amounts of algal growth resulting in populations of herbivorous fish and then eventually carnivorous fish and in most cases these carnivores are eels. The property we were on was in an absolutely stunning area nestled in a hidden valley between a few of the many unnamed hilltops in the area with a creek running through the middle. We were camped in swags at the edge of the farm dam and it was damn cold at night, often dropping into the low single digits. Not the most hospitable conditions but great for trapping eels as food sources are much scarcer in winter than they are in the warmer months. I have attached a mud map to this post. Where the green represents the tree lean at the base of the hills, the brown is relatively flat ground with grasses and a few eucalypts, the darker blue is the farm dam, the lighter blue is the creek that feeds it and the red X is where we were camped. The creek itself is only about 15 m wide at its widest point, but more than 2.5 m in some sections which is quite a considerable depth for waterways in this area. We'd set the eel traps in the dam in the late afternoon, cooked some dinner on the fire after nightfall and fell asleep around 9 pm. I woke up at around 1 am to answer a call of nature, haphazardly got dressed in my swag and stumbled into the freezing night air. I walked about 50 m from camp to a eucalypt tree, 
finished what I had to do and just as I was about to walk back it seemed like the whole top of the nearest hill was lit up with an incredible blue light. It seemed to almost swirl around this hill like a quick moving mist, but it didn't seem to be produced from anywhere in particular, nor was it actually illuminating anything in particular. Sounds funny, but it was just kind of there. I stood there for at least two minutes watching it just sitting near the top of the hill before, almost mesmerized by it, before it slowly just faded away and it was like never there. I was quite perplexed by this and in the back of my mind I was definitely thinking about the strange light I saw at the base of the falls in northern NSW, the first story I told, and truth be told I was feeling very spooked. When I arrived back at camp my friend was wide awake, sitting up in his unzipped swag. I accidentally startled him pretty badly as he thought I was still in my swag, and as soon as he'd calmed down he said did you see it? I immediately thought he was talking about the blue light, and replied with yes, but I was quite taken aback when he then asked did you see its face? Again I forgot to add the picture. Here's the map attached to this post. His story, as he told it, went like this. He was awakened by some disturbance, which was likely me getting out of my swag, and he lay there for a minute or two before deciding that he, too, needed to answer a call of nature. Just as he had unzipped his swag and sat up, he saw somebody across the other side of the dam. He initially thought it might have been me checking the eel traps and he was quite annoyed because they're supposed to be left undisturbed until morning. He was about to yell out to me when the person he could see came into the moonlight. They walked to the farm dam in an odd manner, he said they seemed to push their chest out with each step in a pulse-like motion, bent down at the edge and pulled in the eel trap by the rope. They then picked the trap up and started walking back towards the creek away from the dam. Now at this point he was beginning to think that it was someone who had traveled up the creek and was trying to poach his eels and traps so he yelled out to them at the top of his lungs to, and I quote, drop that shit. In a split second the person dropped the trap, went down on its hands and knees and turned directly towards my friend in a lizard-like motion, and the effect it had on him was incredible. He says it was almost like this thing's face was telescopic and it jumped out at him from the other side of the dam. NB by this point in the story he was beginning to sob and I was telling him to stop talking and calm down a bit but he continued with the story anyway. He seemed to be in serious shock. He was literally frozen with fear when the face jumped at him, and the creature then turned away towards the creek, where he described its movements to be very similar to that of a crocodile entering the water. A few interesting notes. Again, I'm not an artist but I have attempted to draw the face as he explained. See attached picture. I'm not sure if the red lines above the mouth are whiskers or another facial structure, and from memory, he wasn't sure either. I never heard him yell out to the creature even though I was only about 50m away from camp. I think it's a fair assessment that the lights I saw and the creature my friend saw were connected in some way. It was a new moon that night, so it was impossible for the creature to be illuminated by moonlight as my friend explained. The only explanation I can think of is that the lights I saw somehow illuminated it. At sunrise the eel trap was out of the water on the ground between the farm dam and creek but I did not find any footprints or marks at all around it despite the ground being a soft clay. To me personally, this adds credence to my friend's story, because if he moved the trap, and fake serious shock, in order to make up a scary story to tell me, then his footprints would undoubtedly be around the trap. I sat with him for the rest of the night and he calmed down a bit and we left about an hour after first light. I gathered up the eel traps but released the eels as I didn't have the knowledge of how to store or transport them in the tank on friend's truck and he just wanted to get off the property as quick as possible. I didn't tell him about the lights I saw and he never asked why I answered yes to his first question if I didn't see the creature. I still go out and collect eels with him occasionally but he will not talk about what happened that night at all. A few interesting notes. Again, I'm not an artist but I have attempted to draw the face as he explained. See attached picture. I'm not sure if the red lines above the mouth are whiskers or another facial structure, and from memory, he wasn't sure either. 
I never heard him yell out to the creature even though I was only about 50 m away from camp. I think it's a fair assessment that the lights I saw and the creature my friends saw were connected in some way. It was a new moon that night, so it was impossible for the creature to be illuminated by moonlight as my friend explained. The only explanation I can think of is that the lights I saw somehow illuminated it. At sunrise the eel trap was out of the water on the ground between the farm dam and creek but I did not find any footprints or marks at all around it despite the ground being a soft clay. To me personally, this adds credence to my friend's story, because if he moved the trap, and faked serious shock, in order to make up a scary story to tell me, then his footprints would undoubtedly be around the trap. I sat with him for the rest of the night and he calmed down a bit and we left about an hour after first light. I gathered up the eel traps but released the eels as I didn't have the knowledge of how to store or transport them in the tank on friend's truck and he just wanted to get off the property as quick as possible. I didn't tell him about the lights I saw and he never asked why I answered yes to his first question if I didn't see the creature. I still go out and collect eels with him occasionally but he will not talk about what happened that night at all. Forgot to say I would love to hear any stories that you guys have from Australia too. My story happened when I was on year 10 camp. I was out in central Australia about one HRS drive from Kings Canyon helping some aboriginal tribe fix up their school grounds and their prospective new tourism business. Our campsite was a 10 minute walk from the houses and of the tribe's people, and we were about 500 to 1 kilometers away from large rocks slash cliffs, it was all pretty cool actually they showed us their ancestors paintings embedded into the rock face. Anyway the third or fourth night half the Bois are just chilling with the camp leaders and the tribe elder and some other tribe member come up and pull the camp leaders aside, we ears drop as teenagers do and watched intently. The tribe member looked somewhat shaken up, the elder just dead stared our camp leader in the eyes, and said get your boys to bed. At first we though it was because we were too loud, and it was too late, however we had been louder, and at later at night. Furthermore their houses were just around the limit of shouting distance I doubt we were heard that well. Anyway the camp leader looked at us, said you heard him get ready for bed, and us five kinda strolled off hesitantly in different directions. However one of us stayed behind packing away the guitar. What he heard was that the tribe elder was visited by the mountain men and that they come down sometimes to harass the tribe. Normally non-threatening this night they went to the elder and said we want your women and your food. Furthermore the elder said no, and that pissed the mountain men off even more. I'm hazy about the rest of the details but we thought it was funny. Looking back I believe the reaction of the tribe elder and the member were genuine, however I also, to perpetuate a negative stereotype, believe they had a bit too much of something if you know what I mean. Osfren here. Got a couple of spoopa stories. Not me, but a guy I know told me these stories. He goes to a private school in Sydney, his school has a thing where in year 9 or 10 they go away for a whole term to this valley about 2.5 hours south of Sydney for a camp type thing, rich friends I know. The school actually owns the land, massive property, river, full of forest, dense trees. They do stuff like bushwalks and kayaking, camp sort of stuff. They all stay in this one massive boarding house, like a hall, everyone can walk along to anyone else's bed without going through any doors, big hall. He tells me that there is a rumor of a squatter that lives on the property. Apparently when the local council put the area up for sale, he refused to sell his home. The council kicked him out and demolished his home, now he lives somewhere on the property in a self-built shack. One day, he and his mates had free time, so they went on a bushwalk. Chilling about, walking off trail, they end up stumbling upon a random shack, one starts throwing stones at the place, they had heard about the rumors and thought it was bullshit, they think the place is an old abandoned shack. They were wrong. This bald guy in a big trench coat and combat boots comes outside, starts screaming at them to leave. Get off my property. Fucking kids. Stuff like that, 
you know, crazy guy stuff. So they leg it back to the boarding house, tell people, they call bullshit and don't believe them. Day goes on without incident. That night though, he needed to pee, about 3 am, gets up, does his thing, gets back to his bunk, just as he is about to drift off, he sees something move in the corner of his eye, it's the door to the hall. The bunks are set up with the long side against the wall, so he could pretty much see the whole hall from his bunk. The door is slowly shifting open incrementally slowly, he watches, thinking it's someone from his school, but he knows nobody goes out at night, there's no reason to go especially at this time, there's no other civilization for 20 kms. A figure comes into the hall, closes the door quietly, he slowly makes his way down the hall, my friend watching it the whole time. As the figure gets closer, he recognizes the combat boots, bald head cocky trench coat. My mate is flipping shit at this point, but doesn't move, too freaked out. The figure is incredibly silent, he keeps walking closer to his bunk until he stops dead in front of his bunk. My mate almost chits himself but keeps quiet. The figure turns away from his bunk, towards his mate, the same guy who was throwing stones at his shack. He keeps standing there, staring at him for ages, he looks around and notices the guy in the top bunk next to stone thrower's bunk was awake doing the same thing as him, looking at the skinhead with a freaked out look on his face. My friend estimates two or so hours, the skinhead didn't move, he was still staring at stone thrower, who was asleep the whole time. Then, the skinhead starts moving, slow as hell, he turns back toward the door, he and his mate shut their eyes, pretending to sleep. He walks past their bunks, as quiet as he came in, and leaves slowly. The next day the two guys tell stone thrower about what happened, he was freaking out. Yeah, that's it I guess, a bit anticlimactic but still freaky. Another story from same guy, boards at private school, bit of backstory, he's originally from near Jamru, Australia. Jamru is a little town about 2.5 hours drive south of Sydney, about 20 kms from the coast, there's a water park near there. He tells me his uncle used to live about 50 kms west on a farm right next to Bellangalo State Forest. Australia's worst serial killer, Ivan Milat, killed and buried most of his victims, mostly backpackers, in that forest, google it, he's a pretty nasty serial killer. Anyway, this happened a while after Milat was captured. Uncle owns land near forest. Goes for a run pretty much every day to stay fit. Usually runs along the road joining his property. Road connects to one of the fire trails that run deep into the forest, so fire trucks can put out bush fires. Running along, later than usual, had to attend to animals or something like that so it's twilight dark. Running along to where road goes into a cul-de-sac slash dead end, the fire trail entrance comes off the end of the road. He stops to catch his breath, and feels this intense dread, like something really bad has happened, hair stands up, looks around. Then suddenly this 20-something year old, blonde hair and fit girl comes sprinting out of the fire trail. She was screaming run. The uncle just turned around and sprinted, he had a head start so he was in front. He stops running after 200 meters or so, turns around, nobody there, he's seriously spooked. He reckons it's the spirit of one of Milat's victims, warning people not to go near the forest. Second last dump. Osfran here. Be me, maybe seven or eight. Driving to Jindabyne from the ski fields, Yes there is snow in Australia. It's winter, so it gets dark quickly, probs about 6 to 7 pm. Driving along, I'm in middle seat looking out the windscreen. Driving up a hill, you could see the horizon. Three lights in a perfect triangle move in a rainbow shape across the horizon really quickly. Freak out, ask mum if she saw it, she did. That night dream about little green men abducting me paranoid for the rest of the trip. I know it was a dream, not an actual abduction because they were cartoon looking in the dream. Last dump, then I'm off to bed.
used to have a geography teacher at my school whose house was haunted. Subbing for our class one time, teacher was away, told us about happenings. Electronic kids toys, has a baby, starting up in the middle of night, take batteries out, still blast noise. At one point had to throw machines outside so they could sleep, they keep making noise. Things moving around when nobody was home, stuff like that. Anyway, he decides he's had enough and calls Medium to the house. Medium tells him that his family has got the spirit of his wife deceased mum protecting the family. Apparently blocking the doors from the bad spirit at night. They decide to move later on.